I'm Terry Schneider, Executive Director of the Chamber of Commerce here in Stoughton. And again, I would like to thank the folks from the Chateau Restaurant and the, and the Sarah family um, for inviting and hosting us to this lovely dinner. Did everybody have a good dinner? Yes. Excellent. I know that the luncheon um, is a little bit new for us. Our annual has have usually been in the evening, but our celebrity guest speaker is to blame for that. <laughs> she says she has to work tonight, so I think we can all like just check the TV and make sure that was true. <laughs> so I was going to uh, do a big introduction for our celebrity guest speaker and read her bio and bore you with all the things that I have been sending to you in the newsletter and in the reminders and the emails five different times. But instead, I'm going to save you all from me doing that. And I'm going to ask Bob Halloran to do that. <laughs> Bob is a sportscaster with WCVB Channel 5. Bob has been uh, to our chamber before. He's been a guest speaker before. And he's written several books that he's forced, forced me to buy. And I've read them. He's going to be te testing me later. So I'm going to introduce Bob Halloran, sportscaster for WCB Channel 5 and good friend of Maria Stefanos. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate uh, the invitations to come down to Stoughton. I have been friends of the Stoughton Chamber of Commerce for uh, several years now. I always have a good time when I come here. And uh, when I learned that Maria was going to be speaking here, uh, Terry asked if I'd come one more time. And I thought oh, that's, that's fantastic because uh, Maria and I have kind of a, a loose and strange connection that goes back almost 20 years now, um, probably more than 20 years. We both worked in Providence. Uh, she was at Channel 10 when I was at uh, Channel 12. Uh, then we both worked at Fox 25. Um, and now we both work at Channel 5 together, um, which is one of the best things Channel 5 has done um, in my time there was getting Maria to come over. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, we also have a loose connection in that um, we both lived in Foxborough for a short period. Of, I lived there for a short period of time. She's still there. Um, and when I used to bring my boys into the playground, um, she'd come running by on one of her daily runs. And um, when I introduced her to my youngest son, Liam, uh, she fell in love with the name. And a couple of years later, she had a son named Liam. <laughs> So her son was named after my son. Uh, that is odd. Yes. And um, so uh, we've known each other for a very long time. And uh, I don't know how many people in the room know that uh, this past summer I uh, had a brain aneurysm. And um, when I was thinking of coming back to work, um, I needed one more surgery. And I asked Channel 5 if they wanted to do a story um, about the surgery. Um, and I don't know if folks like that kind of a story, if it looks like the reporter is trying to, you know, uh, get attention. But I really wanted to bring attention to aneurysms, and my, my doctor was particularly grateful um, because very little is known about them. So when I asked Channel 5 if they wanted to do a story on it, they did, and I was very pleased that they chose Maria uh, to do it um, because what I learned on the, being on the other side of the camera or the microphone, when you're being interviewed, uh, you're putting a lot of trust in the reporter that they will get the story right, uh, that they'll uh, respect privacy and different elements, especially when I was doing a story like that. So um, trusting Maria came easy and natural, uh, and then she did an outstanding job on it. And it was not an easy story to do uh, because she interviewed me at my home for a good 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, then I was interviewed again after surgery for 30 or 40 minutes, and she interviewed the doctor for a while as well. And you get all that stuff, and you got to knock it down into three and a half, four minutes or something um, to get it all in there and to do such a good job. I was very pleased. Um, the photographer, by the way, um, went in for the surgery, and my wife has seen the uh, surgery. <laughs> I have not yet, but I do have it on a flash drive, and eventually I might take a look at that thing. Uh, but in any event, um, that's my connection with Maria that goes back into the mid-90s, and now we're both well into our 30s. And, um, <laughs> um, and so it's a pleasure to be here with her today, and I introduce Maria Stefanos.
Thank you, Bob. I actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to interview Bob for you. But you really have to take a picture, really. Um, introduce, I'm going to interview Bob for you after. I know you have a camera on me, so I like to do this, because I don't like a barrier. Oh, watch this. I'm a professional. <laughs> So I am Maria Stefanos. I live in Foxborough. I came right up Route 27 to get here. I was behind a sander, and I swore the entire time. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for inviting me here. I am a North Shore girl, but I've lived in Foxborough for 20 plus years. And I do have some Stoughton connections in this room. All the way in the back, Ken Abrams, stand up. He owns Fun Enterprises, which is here in Stoughton. You can clap for Ken. He's a nice guy. <laughs> except when he's your boss. Um, I worked for, no, you were wonderful. I worked for Ken, I was um, an elf, seriously. <laughs> At Jordan Marsh, seriously. Um, in downtown Boston, and I was an Emerson College student just trying to make some money, and I was working at Cheers, and I was doing that, because when you're Greek, and you grow up with parents who expect you to work hard, you do as many jobs as you can to pay for as many things as you can. So that's, that's Ken. Thank you, Ken. All right, Lisa, you stand up, because I've given you more money than I've given Emerson College for my daughter. Come on. Stand up. Miss Lisa Wong from Chinatown, the best, the best. So since my kids were little, 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 we've gone to Chinatown. And sesame chicken and mix, chicken with mixed vegetable and homemade noodle, the best ever. So my daughter comes home from college and says, can we go to Chinatown? I mean, that's our, that, it's, it's part of their lives. It was part of us. We drive up here, you know, we drive up to go get it. The best quality. And really good egg rolls, too, I should say that. <laughs> so uh, these are my little connections in this room, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I prefer to take questions, because you really don't want to hear me going on and on and on and on. So yes, I buy my own dresses. I'll get some of this stuff out of the way, ready? Because I know all the questions you're going to ask. Yes, I buy my own dresses. No, they don't tell me what to wear. Sometimes I make mistakes. No, I don't do my own hair, which you can probably tell because it's really not that fancy. Um, I do my own makeup. I do my own hair. I worked at Fox for 18 years, which was a wonderful job. I was grateful. I was proud. I went to Emerson. I grew up here. And um, new owners came in. And I, I was 50 years old. And I, yes, I'm about to be 51. Why not just say it? I'm not 30, Bob. Um, and I got to a point where I said, you know, let me see. I've watched Channel 5 since I was a kid. And it's, it, it was part of me. And I, I admired the television station always. And I, I thought, let me see. Let me try that. And boy, I'm really glad I did. They are the best people. Quality broadcast, quality people to work for. It's really been a wonderful transition. It's been, it's a wonderful family. And it's hard when, when you go someplace else because people will look at their TVs and say, she's not the same. Why don't we show your boots and all of these things that you get? But, but as I've learned, and I've been there almost a year now, through time, I think we're all getting used to it. So for me, I'm so grateful to be there and to be able to tell stories and, and, and to be part of this. So let me take some questions and we'll get that out of the way. Oh, look at this. This is great. Yes. You said they're not sure. Where, where Groveland, Massachusetts. I will give you, if I had any money in my wallet, I'd give you all the money in my wallet. If you know where it is. Yeah? Come on, do you? Yeah, in that area. Raleigh, Newburyport, Haverhill. Very small, tiny little town, and I grew up in this wonderful house. Yep, so it's there in the North Shore. All right. Yeah. Yes. I'm so proud of you because I feel like I'm young, right? And I'm starting in this industry, and I feel like hearing people who've been in this industry for a while, they say that it's almost impossible to be from the area and become. No, it's not impossible. Nothing is impossible. And she was saying it's impossible to be from the area and then to work in the area. And that's legitimate. It is hard. It's difficult. And they always say, oh, you have to move to Missouri, and then you have to go to Arkansas, and then you have to come back here. But I never accepted that, ever. 
So the furthest I went was Providence. Is that the furthest you went yeah. to? I mean, yeah. we're lucky. And then I was able to come here. But that's because we worked hard, right? That's not that bad. Yeah, that's legit. Well, that's called ESPN, and that's all right, Bob. We get that. Questions? Yes. Being on television, when did you have to Great question. Being on television, when did I have to lose my accent? So I did go to Emerson College, undergrad and grad, and they have a mandatory class called Voice and Articulation. And um, I was forced to take it, and my accent was so bad, I didn't fail it, but I had to go and take more classes. That's how bad my accent was. Yes, Bob? Was that Fran Lashoto? Fran Lashoto! I took uh, a course from her after college. Okay, so I went, I did my voice and articulation class, and then I went back to this woman, and fr her name was Fran Lashoto. Oh, brutal, brutal. <laughs> she, I had a lazy S. You had a lazy S? Yeah. So I, ha I had everything, but she, I did. But I ended up having to pay her money to try to get rid of my accent, truly. It, it, it's crazy, but, but when I'm tired, if it's Friday night, I do not drink alcohol, so it's, it's not that. But on Friday nights, you will know by the end of the week, I, you, that accent starts to come up. When I'm tired, or if I'm four hours into snow coverage, you will hear this Boston accent that I try to pay a lot of money to get rid of. All Boston accent. <laughs> All Boston. Not the bad swears, but the mild ones. <laughs> yes, anybody? Yes? So, um, I'll answer anything, by the way. With WHDA changing Channel 7, like, what, what is the impact going to be on Channel 5? And what, what do, you, do you have to, are there things that you're doing <laughs> in the station? Sort of That's a great question. So, so what's your name? Ellen. Ellen? Ellen just asked if HDH and the NBC thing and the big switch, I actually find it exciting because people who grew up here, people who are from here, what do they like? The same. We don't like change. Am I right? We don't like it. We like the same things. So we have noticed in the ratings very early on, and we have friends there. We have dear friends there. We wish them well. Um, Kim Casey is one of my best friends. She's over at Channel 7 which is now HDH, right? So the point is, is that I think for us, it's a good opportunity where I have not been there a long time, but I've been in the market a long time. I know how to say Stoughton. I know how to say Worcester. You know, I know how to get here. I know how to get there. And I think that, I think that Massachusetts likes that too. And I think that we like people who are, you know, we like, we like that. And I think that that will benefit us. Yes, it's a shiny new toy, and I wish, I really do wish them well. Um, but it is a challenge. Our, what, you know what exactly what, what it is we're doing in the face of this? Nothing. We're not going to go crazy. We're not going to do more things. We're not going to drive around in a vehicle with stormtrooper <laughs> things. You know, I think we're going to be Channel 5. And I think we're the news leader for a reason, and that's, and that's why. And, I, and I'm grateful that that was the decision that was made. Other than the story that you talked about briefly with Bob, um, could you give us, I know you've done a lot of stories, I've seen them. Could you give us one of your favorites? My favorite story, well, I have a million favorite stories. Um, Sammy Bernstein um, was one of my favorite stories. He was a, a, a man I met who fought in Iwo Jima. How do you get an opportunity to interview somebody like that? And he stuck with me, and he was from Randolph. And I'll tell you, I, I'll, never, I'll never get over interviewing him. I was so moved by what he did um, when he was there and on the shores of Iwo Jima, and they gave him a bag, and they said, Catholic or Protestant? And he said, get out of here. I'm neither one of them. I'm a Jew. And they said, well, you have to pick one. And he said, I will not. And he took that bag and he drew the Jew Jewish star on it. And to me, I'm not Jewish, I'm Greek Orthodox. But to me, that story was so much more than religion. It was about a man who believed in who he was and lived his life authentically. And that is why that was one of my favorite stories. Good question. Oh, thanks, Bob. Yes, hi, Ken. Um, how was this year to cover, what was it like covering this presidential election versus previous? 
Would you like to come close and see my gray hair? I am gray. Um, I have a good colorist, Solon Capri in Dedham. Um, it was like nothing I had ever seen. I stood, I, my son was six months old, and I stood in a parking lot in Florida for the 2000 presidential election where they were literally counting hanging chats because nobody knew who our president was. And I thought, I will never see anything like this again. This is insanity. Are you kidding me? That was pie. This was like nothing I've ever seen. And it continues to unfold that way. Um, the difficult thing is social media now, and that's what's changed everything. So if I, if I can't say anything, hint anything, intimate anything, you even give a breath of how you feel about anything, and I've never seen anything like it. I mean, it's, it's, it's vicious. And it's, I'm, it's, 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 very, it's a very difficult time for that. But for me, I'm just staying the course, reporting it like I need to, and you just have to keep, you have to keep going like that. But it's been truly interesting. And really, a shocker. And I'm disappointed in myself in that I am a, just a local news anchor, but why were we shocked? Why were we shocked? Why did we automatically think that that was going to be the outcome? And as a journalist, not as someone who supports either person. I'm an independent. But I just thought, why, why did we do this? We all got caught up in this ball that got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then this happened. It was, it was certainly interesting, to say the least. Yes? All right, I'll keep talking. You have no questions, I'll keep talking. Then I'll bring Bob up. So I find that, do, do you guys, who watches the news at 6 o'clock? That's interesting. And who watches the news at 11 o'clock? Wow, you guys are good. I like you guys. So it is interesting to see what's happened to our industry where who's home at 6 o'clock? Not a lot of people, right? And who's awake at 11 o'clock? Nobody. <laughs> right? I would love to be in bed by 1030, believe me. So that's, that's the challenge in our industry right now is to be relevant, really. And we have our, our smartphones that we have these alerts where if you watch the news, you basically know every. If it's something big, you know it, right? It comes on your phone, correct? The weather, you're going to wait, right? So what do you hope for if you're a news station? You hope that you have familiarity, that people like you. And look, I have a million critics. It's part of the job. I hate that. I hate her. Why does she always wear white nail polish? She's really loud. I can't stand her laugh. But then you have, and then it's a Pedro Martinez syndrome. So you've, you can either focus in on the negative, because those are the loudest people, or you can listen to the people who say, oh, you're wonderful. Oh, I love Channel 5, or I love this, I love that. But we are in this strange part in our lives right now in this television industry where you're, we're, we're being cannibalized by these devices that we walk around with and talk to people on. It's, it's a really strange time. So for me, I'm grateful that I, I got into this however many years ago and that I'm, I continue to be in it. It's really unheard of to be able to go this long and, stay, and be in television, believe me. Yes. Do you see in the future that they'll get rid of the news and everything will be on smartphones or no? Yes. Sure. I th I, but I, I don't know. I like to sit down and watch. So there's something intimate about that. And there's something personal about it. For me, I get the Globe delivered. And I used to get the Herald delivered too when we get the New York Times delivered. I used to get the Herald delivered. It was way too much money. Really, it was. But I love waking up in the morning and putting my newspaper down in front of me and turning the page and reading the stories. Because I'm telling you right now, this is how life is. We do this. We're scrolling, we're scrolling, we're scrolling. And you don't absorb everything. You're not, dige you're not digesting anything. And I don't think that's the way to live a life, right? I think, you, I think we have to just take a pause and, 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 and realize that we're so busy just feeding things in, looking at our phones, looking down, that we forget what's around here. Not to say that phones aren't amazing. They're amazing. I just lost my mother, my, my beautiful mother. And um, sorry. And my mother would text me if I was on at 6 o'clock, 
I get a text, 604. I love that green dress. Why aren't you smiling? I text her back, Ma, 10 people are dead. You're not smiling, when, but I'm saying, right? It was, it was a daily thing. So once my, I taught my mother how to text, it was a beautiful connection where I could be working and my mother could text me and I could text her back. So for that, I embrace it. I, and I embrace the, the information that comes to us in a, in, a, in a nanosecond. But then it also gets tricky and difficult because people are just saying things that nobody's confirming. It's a strange time in this business, really in this world. That's, that's what I think. It's a very strange time. Yes? No, right. It's a great question. I think your job is more important than ever to get to, you know, I hope so, and I, I, I hope so, and I hope that if you, that's the case, because there is a lot, of, it's real, there is a lot of fake news out there, that if you turn to us, you say, okay, this is a station that I've trusted for X amount of years, and you know what you're going to get, but you're right, I, I hope that it makes our jobs more relevant, I really do. Uh, let me ask you guys a question, what is it that you want to see when you watch the news? Do you want to see just the news? Do you want to see personality? How about you? Me? Yes, you. <laughs> well, I was just thinking about that real stuff. I mean, it's all garbage pretty much here. And like, I've heard this before, and then they repeat it. So repetition is a problem. Why don't we sit down and actually get some real stories and put some real stories? OK, but let me ask you this. If we do real stories, real long stories. Not long. Ah, see, that's it. That's honest. And I appreciate that. And that's the thing is that we try so hard. So this is, this is the, the, the never-ending wheel that we're running on. We try so hard to do it right. There's actual stuff going on. There, there is actual there, stuff going on. But then when the other stations get better ratings, and we don't, we're the news leader, that's the truth. Um, but when they get better ratings, just doing the car fire, the fires, the, 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 the murders, the quick, the quick, 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 quick. Then we all reevaluate and say, okay, wait a minute, what are we doing? Well, when you do another half an hour of the exact same thing, I know. you probably switch it over. You're right, you're right. Because I'll change the other channel. So, you will? Not if you're wrong, but. Good okay. answer! Good answer! That's because I gave you advice on how to fix yeah. the stain from the sauce. <laughs> Get a little soda water. Yes. Can I ask you, not Channel 5, but you're affiliated with a national. How could they have screwed up the prediction on who was going to be president of the United States? Well, that's what I was alluding to before. Even more so, they were so sure at 8 o'clock when they first went on that a person was going to win this election, but she forgot the little peoples in all these little towns out in the Midwest. You're right. She walked away from them, and those are the poor people that are in her. And Trump had the right words in a convention that he... Whether he does it all, which I don't think he can, but he talked to them. And he's probably the, one of the richest men around, and they believed him. And then he gets his office in, he's all millionaires working for him. Why? He's successful. Right, and you're right, and I have no defense for that. And I admitted to you that I was really disappointed that all of us kept going down that path. And we know better. We know better. But it was like nothing we had ever covered before and we let that cloud that and I'll only speak for myself I won't speak for the network but I, I will speak for myself yes so let me ask you one because I know you're going to interview Bob so let me ask you a cho I'll give you a choice e either either another good good story or maybe a story that you were not so happy with that you had to do and not Trump nah. sorry no 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 that's okay so so what's I don't so so a story that you that you we're not as comfortable doing uh, Well, I, I hate knocking on doors of people who have lost. Okay. I, and I will never go up to a, a door. And so I was a reporter before I was an anchor. So I didn't just sit up. You know how you see the beauty queens, and um, maybe there's some beauty queens in this room. I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they always stand up there and they say, I want to be a news anchor. Well, I never was that. I wanted to be a reporter, and I am a reporter, and that's how I started. The worst ever is to knock on a door. I'm sorry. It's, this is difficult. I'm sorry you've lost somebody. Would you be? So I've, I've learned through the years how to do it. 
I leave my camera in the car. I never walk up with the camera. I always walk up and knock on the door and say, I'm sorry, I'm Maria Stefanos from wherever it was I was, and I'm sorry for your loss. If you want to talk, great. If not, I will leave right now. Because do you think I want someone knocking on my door if I've lost somebody? I would not. The worst door knock I ever did ended up being the best door knock I ever did. It was September 11th, and the station called me and said, there's a woman in Foxborough, and we think her husband's in the tower. And here's her name, and here's her address. And I thought, are you kidding me? I gotta get out of this business. I do not wanna make this, I do not wanna drive over there and do it. I knocked on the door, and this woman opened the door. There were two little kids playing in the corner, and her name was Cindy McGinty. And I said, Cindy, it's Maria Stefanos from Foxborough, and from Fox, and I'm so sorry, and I don't even wanna be here, and she opened the door and let me in. And she let me into her life, and we are dear, dear friends to this day. And every single year I stand in Foxborough Common, and we do a family fun day in honor of her husband, Mike McGinty, who was in the towers, and he did lose his life. So I could do a door knock and walk away and never talk to these people again, or you can do a door knock and never forget these people. And I've tried to live my life like that because that's how I was raised. So that's the hardest part, but that ended up being the best part because her kids are older now and they're in college, and, and um, it's been very difficult for her, but she's one of my dearest friends. So there's Thank that you. story. Thank, Thank you. you for asking. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Bob Halloran is the best story I've ever covered because this man is, is truly a miracle, a miracle. I've worked with Bob at, at Fox 25, and he was the wittiest, smartest, sharpest sports guy ever. And he has this strange capacity to just have this very deep well of sports information. He does. It's, it's strange how much he knows and remembers. And I've always admired Bob and always liked him. And I, I just loved watching because he's not afraid to say whatever he thinks, for better or for worse, especially in this market where you got to be careful. You cannot speak one ill word of Tom the Saint. <laughs> right? But Bob's not afraid. So I've always loved that about Bob. And then, yes, re fast forward our lives and we're at Channel 5. So we're there and I'm excited. And my first day there, I was really overwhelmed. And I'm not a person who gets overwhelmed or nervous. And I, I was in the kitchen area getting a cup of water, and I saw Bob, and it was like the skies had parted, and the, 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 you know, the sun was out, and the clouds, had, it was beautiful. And I thought, oh. And he made me feel like, OK, this is going to be great. And that was my moment. I said, I, I can do this. Because you get so used to a place for so long that it's strange to go someplace else, but Bob made me feel very comfortable. So we work together, he does a sports cast, he's awesome, funny, clever, creative, great writer, very quick-witted, and um, I don't even remember how we found out, but I think we got a note or something happened in the, in the business, everybody talks, 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 talks. His wife, Eileen Curran, who I worked with, it's that kind of a business, and whom I love, she's, such a good reporter, always fair, very thoughtful. Um, she called and we got word. Bob Halloran had an aneurysm. And I tell you, it was just one of those disconnects. No, no, he didn't. What are you talking about? It's Bob. He's handsome. He's healthy. What are you talking about? And then it comes out that he was at the Patriots um, practice and he was driving from there. Actually, the story is pretty accurate, so... That was smart that Eileen got ahead of it. And he was driving um, from that, and he'll tell you better, and he did, and he, it was not good at the beginning. It was not good. And it was, off, it was just one of those things, the whole newsroom was gutted. Nobody was really even speaking. It was awful, awful. And um, he just stood up here 20 minutes ago. So he has an incredible story. I'd like to be able to have him tell it, because you tell it much better than I do, even though I did tell it on TV. <laughs> Thank you very much. You can tell what a great reporter she is because the storytelling and all that was outstanding. I got chills like three times. Um, yeah, the, the, what happened to me was I, uh, very quickly, I was doing push-ups one day at the gym and I felt a little puff. Wait a, little, a minute, wait a minute. How many? <laughs> How many push-ups were you doing, Bob, and why was there a specific number? I turned 53 years old, so I had to do 53 push-ups. That was the big That's a good story. 
<laughs> yeah, and uh, I plan on doing 54 this year, so we'll see. Um, <laughs> but, um, so I felt a little puff behind my eye. It was um, almost like, uh, what I liken it to is if you've ever blown a big bubble of gum or something, and then when it gets so big it just goes like that, it just pops. And I felt that behind my eye. And I jumped up and looked in the mirror to see if um, I had popped a blood vessel or something like that, and that didn't happen. Um, so I finished my exercise, I went to work for the next three or four days, and I had a headache um, that was worse than any I'd ever had before. Um, but I don't like to uh, call it a migraine, because I know people who've had migraines, they're laid out, they can't do anything. I had a bad headache, it, and it, it did bother me, but I was at work and I was doing other things. So the morning of July 28th, the Patriots were opening training camp. Um, I went to Gillette Stadium, did all my interviews. I also called my doctor uh, and said, can I see you today? I've had a headache for four days and I'd like to find out what's going on. So he said, come on in around three o'clock. So I called my boss and I said, can I get all my work done? Can I do a package for the five and for the six and the Vosat, whatever else you want? Um, and then leave early because I've been fighting a migraine for uh, about four days. And he said, yes. I heard later that they were all mad at me that the opening day of training camp, I wasn't going to be available and things like that. But, um, um, so as I'm driving to uh, Milton Hospital, which is where my doctor's office is, um, I felt like I was going to pass out, things weren't going well. So I tried to park the car um, in front of Blue Hills there in Canton. And according to my math and my phone call that I had made, I was out for about nine minutes. A couple of people who um, were passing by, who I don't know who they are, that's the, one of the saddest parts of my tale is that I don't know who saved my life, but um, these good Samaritans um, who had Spanish accents and ice water with them um, uh, revived me, called 911, an ambulance uh, took me to Milton Hospital uh, where by then my wife had been informed and my son, uh, one of my three sons and my daughter were there and our neighbors were there and so a lot of things were happening really fast. And um, so the doctor at Milton Hospital recognized that this might be an aneurysm very quickly and he called a guy over at Beth Israel uh, in Boston and that's what they decided it was, so then I get another ambulance ride to Beth Israel, and I only just learned this in the past like month or so when my wife and I talk about the details. She said, you were still in the emergency room at Beth Israel um, when they did the surgery to put a stent in your head um, to drain the blood that was going on. Everybody's enjoying lunch? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, so um, I said, I was still in the emergency room? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, did, did they give me like, you know, anesthesia or, or knock me out? And she said, no, you just kept passing out anyway. So they did it then. <laughs> I was like, okay, great. So they put the stent in and um, uh, I was in ICU for 14 days. Um, and the best part of that is I don't remember much of it at all. I have very specific and few memories of the first 14 days. Um, there's some pictures that people took that don't really conjure anything up. But I had one neurologist who'd come in every day, and I, for some reason I remember him. And so the first day he came in, he said, um, what's your favorite television show? And I said, um, Ray Donovan, which is on Showtime Sunday nights at 9 o'clock. And he said, okay, I'm going to come back tomorrow, and you're going to give me that information. Um, and that was me passing some neurological test. So every day he'd come in, I'd say, here he is, the least inquisitive doctor I've ever met. He wants to know one thing. It's Ray Donovan, Showtime, Sunday's 9 o'clock. And um, I don't mind telling you here, uh, that was $795 every time he walked in. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm getting off the beaten path, but we... Right, no. We've started to get the... We got the bill... 150 grand this thing cost, and wow. it ends up costing us, you know, just a little bit because of insurance. But the uh, ambulance rides that I took, they were out of network. So from from Blue Hills to Milton Hospital, that was like uh, $3,200 or something. From Milton Hospital, Beth Israel was 3,900, and about 800 of that was covered. So I'm on the hook for an ambulance rides for about six or seven thousand dollars. My wife is still fighting that. So we'll see how that goes. You can't even remember it. Yeah, I don't remember any of those things. Yeah. But, um, and so, uh, very quickly, I don't know how long we have, but um, after 17 days in the hospital, they sent me home. 
And they just said, you can go home now. And I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do? And they said, whatever you can do. And so there was no dietary restrictions. I could drink alcohol if I wanted to. I could exercise to the extent that I could. Do you have a question? Um, the aneurysm that you had, did they give you a shot to stop it? No. So, um... <coughs> I had a slow leak, um, so whatever blood vessel I had up there, when I felt that puff, that was it popping ever so slightly, and then it leaked for four days and put, you know. So they didn't have to give you the shot to stop it? No, no. They, what they had to do was cut a hole in the top of my head and start draining it. Twice. Uh, twice, apparently. Yeah, right. And um, so then the, the other fun part was when they sent me home, um, I felt pretty good, you know, I was uh, walking around the neighborhood with a cane, I had lost about 25 pounds um, off this little frame and everything, so I was pretty frail. Um, but I was calling work and um, emailing my news director and saying, I think I can come back to work in a couple of weeks and, you know, I'm waiting for a clearance from the doctor and this and that and the other thing. And they're like, okay, cool. And um, after, I'm home for about three weeks, I came home from a lunch meeting and was telling my wife, that um, I said, I'm telling these stories to this guy, and in the middle of each one, I couldn't remember the details of it. And I, I just felt like, you know, and this is my story. I was telling them stuff about me that I'd told other people a hundred times. I couldn't remember the details. And I thought that was odd. And she goes, oh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll make a note and we'll tell the doctor. And then I walked down the hall, looked into our bedroom, and saw my shoes under the bed on the right-hand side. And then I went back, to, I, have I always slept on that side of the bed? And um, she said, yeah, 14 years. And I go, I, don't, I see myself on the other side. And so that was a scaryish kind of a moment where, you know, something that you've done every day for the last 14 years doesn't seem familiar anymore. So she called the uh, doctor and they said, well, we better put a shunt in. And so that's when they did the surgery that uh, Maria and the cameraman came and, um, you know, did the story on so that we could educate people about aneurysms and things like that. Um, and the that was an amazing experience, though, because I went in um, not really being able to remember details about lots of different things. The whole week leading up to it was one forgetful thing after another. I wake up from the surgery, and it's like a series of flashbulbs, and I could remember everything that I had forgotten. I remembered each of the conversations that I had had where details were omitted, and I could remember the details that I had forgotten. And it all happened so fast. Um, the doctor came in and he said, okay, you can go home. So I had brain surgery and went home. <laughs> and the, uh, the biggest issue I had, and that was almost funny too, is that um, so they, they put the shunt in my head, which is kind of a vessel to take your brain fluid, and it's attached to a catheter that goes from my neck down into my chest and into my uh, stomach wall so that it'll excrete the way everybody else's does. Um, and so in order to do that, they're shoving a catheter into place, and they realized that I had a hernia. So they fixed that while they were in there. <laughs> that, worked, that worked out great. Um, and it, so there's a little, I think I can tell this joke here and stuff like that, because I, I thought that um, if they had done a colonoscopy, it would have worked out great, because I could have had my head up my ass the whole time. <laughs> So, thank you very much. Um, so, um, You're gonna be here all week. right. So when I went home from the second brain surgery, um, my real issue was with the hernia procedure because I couldn't lift anything, and you know I had stitches in my stomach and stuff. So the head was sensitive and all the rest, but I felt great. And so then I was just waiting to get back to work and get back to normal, and I was exercising. Things like sneezing, coughing, laughing, um, yelling. That hurts a lot. I, don't know. I still don't like to do that. Um, I curse the uh, cleaning people who would like to put my sneakers and shoes under the middle of the bed for some reason. And so then I got to get down on all fours and reach in there. That hurts. I don't like that either. Um, but, the, uh, but I just went to the neurologist uh, last Thursday and um, he said, you know, I'm getting an A plus in terms of recovery and that um, I do. I feel great. There's so little going on. So thank you. Uh, Yeah, well, that was one of the most beautiful things that uh, I experienced was, um, you know, because you know, Maria talks about the critics that we all have. I would tell you that 
people who don't like me, they know how to use um, voicemail and email. They're okay with that. Everybody who's ever come up to me and talked to me, um, who contacts me on Facebook or Twitter or something like that, they all say the nicest things. And I didn't really recognize how helpful that is. When you're not feeling well, uh, when you're scared or and, you know, physically you're in pain and those types of things, and you start flipping through. I had, I think the number was 839 Facebook posts the first day. Um, uh, and I'm just going through. And I was looking for the person who was going to mock me or yell at me or, you know, say, I hope you die. Because um, I think those people... That's pe real. Yeah, those yeah. people exist. And I didn't find one. 839 little bolts of energy and positivity and all the rest of that stuff. Um, I do think it, it helped. It mattered a lot to me. Um, and... Facebook posts are great because I can type back a response and say thank you very much very quickly. The old-fashioned people who wrote me cards and letters that I then had to write them back, that takes a long time. So, <laughs> so if anybody wants to reach me, Bob Halloran at yahoo.com. Um, but, um, you know, I got, I got you pretty quickly, if there's any questions, but this is really uh, no, Maria's time, but um, uh, go. Yeah, one, one quick thing, uh, to go back to the morbid part of it, um, I had read, I'm curious if it was true, I had read uh, your chances back when it first happened, if you had not been in, like you said, if those people had not stopped and helped you, um, I had read your chances were very poor. Yes, um, people who suffer an aneurysm like I had, um, at least 50% don't make it at all, oh. and of the 50% who survive, a good 30 or 40 percent of those, um, or no, I guess I, it's a higher number, um, of, of that percentage are left with some sort of disability, whether, you know, I didn't have any issues with my speech, I didn't have any real issues with my motor skills, um, so my recovery, I'm just a lot luckier than other people, but I would say that I'm a bit of a test case. Um, the woman across the street from me is a nurse at Milton Hospital, and when I came home, um, three or four weeks had passed, and she said, they're still talking about you at the hospital. And it wasn't so much me, it was the fact that everybody along the way did exactly what they were supposed to do in a timely fashion, otherwise I would not have had the result that I had. So the EMTs and the Good Samaritans and then the doctor uh, Mahoney at Milton Hospital who recognized it. And then the other part, my wife was there with our friend uh, Sue, who's a nurse, and um, so they say, it looks like an aneurysm, and my, my wife says, well, we've got to get him to Mass General and right away. And uh, the doctor said, well, actually, is there somebody over at Beth Israel who's one of the top in the country? Um, and my wife says, um, who is it? And he says, Dr. Chris Ogilvy. And my wife is on the phone, and so is Sue on the phone, and they're Googling Dr. Chris Ogilvy, and okay, he can go to Beth Israel. <laughs> and apparently this guy is one of the top three or four in the country, and he really did do an outstanding job. So um, I got no issues. <laughs> yeah. Is, it just, is there anything you could have done to prevent it, or is it just... No, just and that's really one okay, of the okay. things. Like, you know, uh, it's... The only thing that I feel like I could have uh, educated people with about aneurysms in general is to listen to your body. Because um, I apologize for not knowing the answer to this question, but if I, I don't get headaches. So when I had one for a day or two and the Advil wasn't taking care of it, I should have known something sooner than that. But honestly, I'd already suffered the aneurysm. So if I had gone to the doctor, maybe I don't pass out, maybe this isn't an emergency, but they still would have had to do the, the different surgeries. I think I could have uh, done without the second one, um, because that was caused because of the damage that the blood on the brain did for two weeks um, caused enough issues that they had to take care of it. If I had gone after the first or second day of the headache, maybe that would have been prevented. But, um, so. A friend of mine, she had a tooth removed, and after that she was getting pains in her legs, and um, she didn't know why she was getting pains in her legs, and when she went to the um, orthopedic doctor, she was telling him how she, you know, she had a, a tooth removed, and you know, right after that she started getting pains in her legs, so just a precaution, they took her and did a CAT scan, mm -hmm. and they found out she had an aneurysm. Wow. Uh, and so they... Yep. 
Well, I, I put my hands on all the smart people in the world. And there's so many of them out there, whether they're fixing my car or my computer or my head. Um, I'm very grateful, and that's why I would say that if um, if you feel something, you know, there's no reason why you wouldn't go to the doctor and explain it and find out what's going on. Um, so I wish I had done that, but um, so. yeah. Feeling good? Thank you, Bob. See, isn't that? A, and he's—I can't believe he works every night. It's amazing. It's incredible. And he said the Patriots are going to win on Saturday. He did. No, he did. He said easily. He said it's the following week that we have to worry about. I'm just being honest. So I'm grateful to talk with you because I am a girl who lives in Foxborough, who grew up in Groveland, and I speak at a lot of Chamber of Commerces because I think that this is who we are. I think that you guys make up our communities and make our communities a better place to live. I do feel that way. So I thank you for what it is you do, and thank you for inviting me here. And any more questions that you thought of? Yes. Did I go to what? Alyssa's wedding. Alyssa's wedding? The, um, the lady who's on, uh, oh, tells about the direction, uh, the traffic. Oh, 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 did, no, I had to work. Oh, this yes, I had to work for everybody because they all went. Uh, <laughs> no, it was, I don't really know if you want to. I'll take it to me. I'm going to use Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. All the, all the way back. What's it like in this media market to be kind of followed around as like a your own? You make news, like when you do something. Like I remember you had a story with John Dennis. Yeah. When he didn't uh, when he was kind of having his outs with WEI. So what's that kind of like that the media figures in this market are stories unto themselves? I hate it. I just want to do my job. I just, I love when people come up to me at CVS or at Shaw's or whatever, and I love saying hi to people, learning about people, where are they from, you guys own certain cleaners, you know, I love that. Which church do you go to? They go to the Brockton Church. That's the stuff I love to, to talk to. These people here, these lovely people, we have mutual friends. So that's the part of it I like, but I don't ever want to be a story, ever. <laughs> really, that's, I'm not in it for that. If I w were, I, my hair would look better, but it doesn't. So I'm not in it for that. I'm in it for the, st the storytelling. Yes? I, I, I was going to tell you that this was de really delightful. Oh, you're nice. Day. And I think for anybody who doesn't watch Channel 5, they should watch it. Appreciate no, that was nice. You're so nice. I really do appreciate it. I really do. I love what I do. Can you guys bring Dickie back? Yeah, yeah. People loved. I love Dick Albert. Yeah. Not Natalie though. Natalie's good being away. <laughs> oh, we can't end on that. Someone else say something nice. <laughs> so I thank you all. Um, I can say something nice. Oh, oh! I love hydrangeas. I get to say something nice. How unusual. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Maria. I think uh, she sort of has an answered the question by some of the stories she's told, uh, why we need people like her, why, why it's not going to be just on the iPhone or just on the iPad. Um, these, are, these are the stories that you would just not hear and you would not recognize where they were coming from. Uh, I think the reason why this was a successful meeting, um, that the food is great, <laughs> is because of people with name recognition like Maria Stefanos and Bob Halloran, and I just don't know if you'll get have that down the road um, if we didn't have these people doing what they do every day. So I wanted to thank Maria for being with us thank and you. being such a wonderful guest, and I got these for her. And They're beautiful. They're beautiful. Thank you. That's, uh, now I'm the beauty queen. I would like to be a news anchor when I grow up. I'm told, I'm told that those are, those are, the, are Greek colors. They are, blue and white. I actually <laughs> I want to thank Bob also for uh, yeah, coming Bob's and spending best. some time with us. And, and I have to agree with, thank you. I have to agree with what Ellen had said. 
um, that this was a wonderful event, a wonderful opportunity. Um, you know, it's fun. We, this is our annual meeting, but it's always fun you know, to hear from people who are not just directly related to business. But I think we would find that whatever happens in the news does affect our businesses. So hearing from the people who uh, you know, literally deal with it every day uh, really benefits us. So thank you. I also want to mention if um, Bob Halloran, uh, as I may have mentioned earlier, um, is an author of many books, five of which I've read. And uh, he'd be more than happy. He keeps them in his trunk. <laughs> and uh, just come up to him. He'll, he'll sign it right there. It's right. sad but true. Yeah. Great writer. He only asked for $20 more for the signature. <laughs> so thank you, Bob, for coming and being with us uh, in more ways than one. Thank you, everybody, for coming.